In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Greetings, my brothers and sisters in Christ, on this 19th day, in the month of September, in the year of our Lord 2020. In this segment, Learning to Live in God's Divine Will, I would like to wrap up our theme of spiritual marriage and living in the divine will. In the last segment, I addressed the triple act of the soul in the divine will and its participation in God's triune operation. And to recap a little bit, the soul receives immediately when it desires to live in God's will with an upright intention and a firm resolve. This triune operation within it, the soul immediately participates in God's triune operation with a firm resolve and upright intention, desiring to live in his will. The reason for this immediacy is predicated upon God's desire to give us the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit that has been reserved for these end times. So before these end times, this gift was not available due to no fault of any saint or human being conceived in sin. Rather, just as God has preserved the incarnation of Christ for 4,000 years, he preserved the time for its actualization in the world for 4,000 years. So he has preserved this gift for 6,000 years. You see, God the Father created the world and after the expulsion from Edom of, of Adam and Eve, he redeemed it by virtue of the incarnation of Christ through the second person of the Holy Trinity's fiat. And this fiat is a word which means may it be so pronounced by the Son in the consistory of the Holy Trinity. And then, after 2,000 years again, the Holy Spirit is pronouncing his fiat. And this fiat of the Holy Spirit occurs in these end times. And the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a creature conceived in original sin was in the late 19th century. That's when it began. That's when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit began in human nature through the servant of God, Luis Picareta. But from that moment on, it is available to all of us conceived in sin like her. 
Now, Louisa wrote many works, and apart from her letters, her Christmas novena, you know, her childhood memoirs, the hours of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary in the kingdom of the divine will, the pious pilgrimage of the soul in creation, and the volumes, 36 in all, she wrote also beautiful appeals from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to mankind. And this triune appeal is nothing other than an exhortation from the Trinity to human nature, to mankind, to welcome this gift that God desires to give us immediately. And this immediacy is manifest in various passages of Louisa's writings, also in my approved doctoral dissertation, which is uh, in section 4, 181, chapter 4, that is. And um, to give you a few examples of this immediacy, that anyone in the state of grace may immediately experience God's eternal operation as expressed and manifest in Adam and Eve, is affirmed in Louisa's writings where Jesus reveals that the divine will's creative power immediately enters the soul as soon as it yields its own interests to those of God with a simple but firm act of the will. Now this passage is found in particular in volume 12. February 16, 1921, where Louisa relates, While I was thinking about the holy divine will, my sweet Jesus said, My daughter, to enter into my will, the soul does nothing other than remove the pebble of its will. If the soul removes the pebble of its will in that same instant, it flows in me and I in the soul. It finds all treasures at its disposal, you see. So here the Lord saying in that same instant that the soul desires, removes the pebble of its will, God enters it. So he states, in that same instant it flows in me and I in the soul, the soul finds all of my treasures at its disposal, light, strength, assistance, and all that it desires. It is enough that the soul desires it and everything is done. You see, desire is the key. Not knowledge. You see, there's two types of knowledge, general and particular. To enter into this will of God immediately, implicit desire is sufficient. Being in the state of grace, of course, and desiring whatever God's, whatever gifts God's will desires for it. And God will give this gift to the soul, but once God gives this gift to the soul for its admission into his eternal operation, by virtue of the soul's desire and general knowledge, God's grace will lead it progressively to the explicit knowledge of Louisa's writings. You see, there were several saints that received this gift without any explicit knowledge of Louisa's writings. And they are mentioned in my book, prefaced by two Catholic bishops entitled The Splendor of Creation. And to give you just a few, I recall Father um, Walter Chiswick, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, St. John Paul II. Um, you have uh, Archbishop, uh, the Servant of God, Archbishop Maria Luis Martinez, Venerable Concepcion Cabrera de Armida, Blessed Dina Belanger, Sister Mary of the Holy Trinity, Blessed Elizabeth of the Holy Trinity, Venerable Martha Robert, and the list goes on. All of these had no knowledge of Louisa's writings, and yet their writings express that they received this gift by the characteristics that they exemplified in their life, and that is found in their writings. Another excerpt that manifests the immediacy of the reception of this gift in these end times is found in volume 12 again on December 6th, 1919. Jesus relates, as soon as you make up your mind, you see the key words, as soon as, 
You make up your mind. That means a firm resolve with an upright intention. I run and together with you renew my creative power by imparting to you the power to accomplish all the good you desire. And again, in the, on December 26, 1919, as soon as the soul disposes itself to do my will, even at the cost of any sacrifice, that's a firm resolve. My will in finding everything prepared and disposed communicates itself to the soul without delay. Pouring out the good it contains and forming the heroes, the martyrs of the divine will, and the most unheard of wonders. And uh, to give you one final example, and there are more. Volume 30, December 21st, 1931. Jesus tells Louisa, the power of my creative word will dispose souls as it instills desire in them and transforms their human will. And in knowing that I want to open the doors to my will, they will knock and immediately I will open to them and be pleased. You see? So... The Holy Trinity wants to give to us this gift that has been reserved and in a way preserved for 6,000 years. God refers to this gift in the writings of Louisa as being suspended, meaning it was never destroyed, it was never removed. Um, definitively or absolutely from human nature, but simply suspended or waiting for its reactualization in human nature. And that reactualization occurred after 6,000 years since man's creation, 2,000 years since the redemption, beginning with the servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, whereby the Holy Trinity indwells in the soul's intellect, memory, and will, heart, breath, and blood establishing a psychosomatic triune indwelling in the soul, which is a new presence that God reveals as his, in quotes, real life in the soul. And this real life is identical to Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist. As mentioned in previous broadcasts, the only difference between Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist and his real life in the soul who lives in his will is this. His divine person is the suppositum, the subject of this indwelling in the Eucharist. Whereas in us, it's our human person that is the suppositum, the subject of this indwelling. I also spoke about the soul's triple act, and to recap, there are three stages to this triple act. That begins with God who disposes the soul to operate with God, with the three divine persons, and become their echo. Through the soul's consent of the intellect, memory, and will respectively to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, and to the Father. And then the soul, after having received this creative power of God that disposes the soul to operate as one with the Trinity, continuously grows in God's creative power by repeating its divine acts of bilocation in God and in creation with its own operating love. And the third step is the soul having grown in God's creative power with the repetition of its divine acts completes each of its acts with greater love to the greater glory of God. And at this point, the soul then reigns in God, sorry, the divine will then reigns in the soul with the fullness of its dominion and with no less power than in the three divine persons. 
Remember this triple operation of the triple act of the soul and the a divine will is not the fruit of the soul's operation, it's the fruit of God's operation along with the soul's cooperation. And this brings us to the divine indwelling. God the Father concurs with the Son and the Holy Spirit in the soul by filling its act with the triune operation. Every time the soul of the human creature seeks to accomplish its divine acts, God the Father concurs with the Son and the Holy Spirit by filling its act with their triune operation and investing it with the Father's operating, communicating, and transforming will. For the divine will within its operative act transports the divine trinity into the creature. This is called an act of triune by location and encloses itself in the soul. The Trinity closes itself in the soul while the creature's soul remains bilocated with the Trinity in heaven. This is found in the writings of the Blessed Virgin Mary book, where Mary in the womb of Anne, while being in the womb of Anne, was going back and forth to the Trinity in heaven. Mary's seed was bilocating. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 16 on September 6, 1923. My daughter, you give me a dwelling within you on earth while I keep you in heaven, inside my heart. So while you are on earth, you are with me in heaven. The divinity delights with its little daughter of our supreme will, having her with us in heaven. So the will of the three divine persons encloses its one eternal operation in the soul and communicates to it a part of God's divine substance. And this occurs by the will and love of the most holy trinity who forms, raises, and develops the soul's acts to establish its indwelling within it. And as I mentioned previously, if on the one hand Jesus reassures Louisa that no creature can contain the full value of one act in the divine will, much less contain the Trinity, yet it can contain the Trinity. Jesus also reveals that God may grant us all the grace and the capacity to enclose within itself his eternal operation. So it encloses the Trinity's operation, you see, the will of the Trinity. While the Trinity is imminent in the soul, it transcends the soul. Just as God is in us, yet he transcends us. Just as God is in the Eucharist, yet he transcends the Eucharist. So God is in the soul who lives in the divine will, yet transcends it. And for this reason, by virtue of this binomial of imminency and transcendency, the soul is necessarily on earth and in heaven at the same time because God is in both places at once. Therefore, so is the soul who lives in his will on earth. As the soul attains to greater union with the divine will, it arrives at the point of becoming completely divinized and transformed in the Trinity. And by means of this divinization, the soul hastens the reign of the divine will in souls on earth. It hastens this reign by accomplishing its divine acts that cast throughout creation the divine will's uncreated light from the center of the most holy trinity, which enriches all things and unites all things on earth in the divine will. We find this <clears throat> teaching in volume 19 on May 27th, 1926. To 
get to the guts of it, the kernel of it, Jesus relates in this long passage. The totality of my uncreated light is so profoundly united that it is inseparable and indivisible. And greater than the sun, it possesses the eternal unity in which the triumph of God and all of our works is realized. Now this triumph of the unity of my supreme will is the center of the most holy trinity. The center of our a holy abode and of our throne. And from this divine center, our most refulgent rays go forth and invest the whole heavenly homeland. All the saints and angels are invested by the unity of our will, and they all receive its innumerable effects. And drawing all things to itself, our will makes of them one single unity within the supreme unity of our will. These rays invest all creation and establish its unity with the soul who lives in our will. And this unity of the light of my will, which abides in the center of the three divine persons, is already fixed in you, Louisa. So one is the light of the light of my will. One is the act and one is the will. Now, whenever you do your acts in this unity, know that they are already incorporated in one single act within the center. And the divinity is already within you doing what you do. My heavenly mother, the saints, the angels, and all creation, repeat your acts in chorus and feel in your acts the effects of our supreme will. So be attentive to the never-before-seen prodigy of our single act that fills heaven and earth with the Trinity uniting itself with the human creature and placing itself as the primary act of the human creature's acts. See, when Jesus there says that the divine will places itself as the primary act of the human creature's acts, he's stating that we are not operating. The human creature is cooperating while God is operating. And therefore, attentiveness is necessary so that we can do what God desires of us. To Louisa, Jesus reveals that she had become the center of his humanity in whom the fullness of the divine will dwelt, and that the unity of this light of his will, which abides in the center of the three divine persons, was already fixed in her. Naturally, Mary far exceeded Louisa in this regard. No one can compare with Mary. No one can rival Mary's holiness. Mary was conceived without original sin. No other creature was. And also she was endowed with prerogatives Louisa was never given, such as the office of the mother of God. Louisa, of course, is called a second mother. Mary is the first. Louisa is the little daughter. Mary is the big daughter. And like Louisa, the soul that lives in the divine will becomes Jesus' center, whose acts he absorbs in his uncreated light which empowers the soul to absorb all of God within its act, to concur with the Trinity's operation and concur with the acts of the angels and saints. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 25, February 3rd, 1929, all in heaven are fixed on you and by the irresistible force of my fiat, its inhabitants feel so assimilated with you, Louisa, that they cannot help but gaze on you, love you, and concur with all of your acts. And it behooves you to know that the angels, the saints, and the Holy Queen Mary are all in one accord. Their being forms one single act in the divine will. Indeed, nothing but the divine will may be seen in each one of them. So here the Lord's telling Louisa that all the inhabitants in heaven 
feel assimilated with her acts, that they cannot help but gaze upon her, love her, and concur with all that which she does. You see, this means that Louisa has arrived at the center of the tri triune unity that unifies all things within the center of its abode. And Louisa entered the center at the age of 35 on November 16th, 1900. This is a very important date in spiritual theology because it's the first time in the history of the church, in the history of theology, that a human being conceived in sin enters the center of the Trinity, the abode of the Trinity, and invites all other human beings to enter therein. This is a very important date. So although Louisa received the gift at the age of 24, she did not enter the center of the unity of the Trinity until she was 35, nine years later. Inasmuch as God makes himself the temple of the soul that lives in his divine will, the soul enjoys the indwelling of the Trinity and sharing in his prime motion, this creative power, this prime act that empowered Adam's soul and body as well as Eve's. Now, Paul speaks of us being the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we are. But in addition to that, with the outpouring of the gift of living in the divine will, in addition to being the temple of the Holy Spirit, God makes himself our soul's temple. And this is found in volume 33, March 11th, 1934. Louisa appropriates to God the Father the motive force of the soul's will and the body's heartbeat. This is a psychosomatic indwelling of the Father in human creatures, conceived in sin, living in his will. To the Son, the motive force of the soul's intellect and the body's blood flow. And to the Holy Spirit, the motive force of the soul's memory and the body's breath, thereby making God the temple of the soul, whereby the soul concurs in all that which God does. and establishing within the soul a triune indwelling. At this halfway mark, I wish to remind the listeners to continue in your effort to support Radio Maria through your prayers and monetary aid, because this is a commercial-free and 100% listener-supported program. Now, when the soul in whom the Trinity abides God interiorly reenacts what Jesus accomplished in his humanity. Think of that. Paul says, and I'm paraphrasing, Christ has no body but yours. He has no hands but yours, no feet but yours. God wishes to reproduce another humanity of Christ in us. But this is not possible unless we welcome the humanity of Christ, which brings with it the Father and the Holy Spirit. We cannot ascend to the Father if not through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the soul in whom the Trinity abides, God interiorly reenacts what Jesus accomplished in his humanity <clears throat> and copies the model of the Trinity's eternal operation that Jesus' humanity possessed, which embraces all creation. <clears throat> now, the Trinity operates in the soul in an habitually immediate, immediate and direct manner. The Holy Spirit, whom the soul receives in baptism, operates within it in the same manner that he operates in Jesus' soul. And what manner is that? With the fullness of grace. And this is found in volume 9, March 23, 1910, 
and in volume 16, September 21st, 1923, whereby the soul lives inside the Father, who places it in the center of all the works of his operation at Extra. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the soul lives inside the Father. This is why the Trinity is a temple of the soul. <clears throat> Louisa was told by our Lord on August 14th, 1917 in volume 12. Living in the divine will means to remain inseparable from it. To do nothing of one's own accord. For in the presence of the divine will, the soul feels of itself incapable of anything. The soul neither asks nor receives commands, as it, it is incapable of advancing by itself. Whence it says, if you want me to do something, let us do it together. And if you want me to go somewhere, let us do it together. Like a child, the soul does everything its father does. If the father thinks, it makes the thoughts of the father its own. And does not add one thought of it, its own, to those of its father. If the father looks, speaks, works, suffers, walks, or loves, the soul also looks at what the father sees, repeats the father's words, works with the father's hands, walks with the father's feet, suffers the same pains as the father, and loves with the father's love. Such a soul lives inside the father and not outside of him. Unquote. <coughs> See, sorry for my clearing my throat. I haven't spoken all day today, and that tends to be the case with people that live like a hermit, that live alone, especially during this COVID crisis. So thank you for your patience. Now notice in this passage, Louisa writes the word father in both the lower and upper case. As she spontaneously moves from the example of the earthly father to the heavenly father. Well, you wouldn't know this unless you read the actual Italian or my translation thereof in my dissertation. And this explains why she affirms that the father suffers. See, in heaven, the heavenly father does not suffer, but the earthly father does. The heavenly father and the Holy Spirit do not suffer. Only the Son of God, who assumed a human nature, does. The Father and the Spirit experience sorrow, not suffering. There's a difference. Sorrow is interior. Suffering is exterior. Pains is the blending of the two. Now, the soul's desire to absorb God, all of God in its act, to give back to him in, in his entirety, in the same manner in which it absorbed him, and then absorbs him once again, is, I know this sounds a little bit theologically uh, complicated, but this is what the soul experiences on the inside when it's living in the center of God. Let me go through that once more. The soul in whom the Trinity dwells, and of which God makes himself the temple, desires to absorb all of God within its act, whether it's an act of breathing, an act of thinking, a prevenient act, an actual act, and not just absorb all of God within its act, but to give back to God in its entirety all that which God had given him and that it had absorbed and then it absorbs God all over again. It's a continuous, sort of what they call in theology among the three divine persons, perichoresis, which is like a, a divine waltz, if you will, or dance among the three persons. They're continuously in the, in this, in the act, without beginning or end, of generation and procession. The Father is eternally generating the Son, and the Son is eternally 
requiting the love of the Father, whereby the Holy Spirit proceeds from both. This act of the divine trinity is called perichoresis. And the same thing happens in us on a smaller scale. We're not God, of course, in the sense that we absorb all of God the Father by virtue of the Son's humanity. To give back to the Father through the Son everything the Father gave us through him by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we do it all over again. This is the interior dynamic that occurs when we are doing all of our acts in the divine will. This is the thing we do not see. And if you wish to find where this is found in Louise's writings, go to volume 13, November 26, 1921. Sort of like breathing, right? To break it down in simple words or analogies. What happens when you breathe? You absorb the air, the oxygen. Your lungs receive the breath of life, like Adam at the moment of creation. That air penetrates your being, enlivens your being, sustains your being, assimilates within your being. And then you release that air, you exhale, giving back to the air that which you received from it only to do it all over again. Just as the Father continues to lovingly generate the Son, and the Son continuously exchanges the Father's love from whence the Holy Spirit proceeds, so the Father's power, the Son's wisdom, and the Holy Spirit's love continuously absorb the soul in its acts, enabling it to habitually participate in the fullness of the Godhead, whereby it becomes full of grace on a much smaller scale, of course, than Mary and Louisa, who were called to be, in that order, the harbingers of this gift. To Louisa, Jesus reveals the great difference between God's personal presence in the baptized soul in grace and in the soul that lives in his divine will. This is found in volume 33, March 11th, 1934. It's a very long passage. But to summarize it, the soul that is baptized in God's grace, that does not live in his will, is the temple of God that is exposed, Jesus tells Louisa, to dangers and passions. The soul that lives in his divine will, God makes of it, um, God makes himself the temple of the soul, rather, I should say. Of the soul who lives in God's will, God makes himself the temple that is not exposed to dangers or passions, as it is like a little host who possesses its Jesus consecrated within it, so that it may embrace everyone to make itself the life of every soul. This is found in that passage I just shared with you. Jesus uses these expressions, March 11th, 1934. By becoming the temple of the soul, God establishes a permanent union with it, as it now resides inside of him and inside the supreme being of the Trinity. And from this soul, Christ renders himself inseparable. Now let me quote two passages from that last these last two sentences. First, the soul resides in God and inside the supreme being of the Trinity. This is found in volume 24. August, sorry, volume 26, August 6th, 1938 where Jesus reveals, my love for the soul who lives in my fiat is so great that whenever my fiat feels the need to breathe, to eat, or to move, I feel the need to form within the soul one single life. For my will, living within the soul, transformed it into my breath, into my heartbeat, into my motion, and into my food. 
When he says food, he means, you know, daily bread. It's sustenance, spiritual sustenance. See then how I need the soul's permanent union with me and in me. I would otherwise feel the breath, motion, heartbeat, and food of my love missing from all souls. Oh, how sorrowful I would feel, since the soul who lives in my will is inside our supreme being. It is the speaking, moving, and palpitating soul who in the name of all creation brings us the food of love that all creatures should have given us. Otherwise put, the soul who lives in God's divine will lives in the Trinity and gives him the glory that all creatures should have given him. And this is also revisited in volume three on March 11th, 1900. To Louisa, her soul in purgatory describes its permanent state in the divine will as that of being within a body or temple where it does only what God wishes. Louisa describes the liquid fire of purgatory also in this same volume as that which purges the soul of all that which is sterile and makes it shine. So, the Trinity's being is inside the soul, and the soul is inside the Trinity's being. And this occurs, as I mentioned, by this absorption of God and re- giving back to God and reabsorbing God and giving again back to God, whereby the soul is the temple of God, and yet God is the temple of the soul both one and at the same time. Much like the light of Adam was inside of him and yet outside of him, the Son created light of God, which is God. God is light from light and true God from true God, right? Jesus is light. And this light of the Trinity did not just envelop Adam's body like it enveloped Christ's soul on Mount Tabor at the Transfiguration, but it entered first within him which gave him life, as I articulated in the last segment, where the divine uncreated light of God formed rays, and the tips of these rays created the will of Adam, the intellect of Adam, the memory of Adam. Adam's soul was created by the light of God that dwelt within him, and yet covered his body at the same time. So this light being inside Adam and outside of Adam made Adam the temple of God and God the temple of Adam. And the same light does the same to us, whereby we become the temple of God and God our temple. And from this soul, Christ renders himself inseparable. This is found in volume 24, August 12th, 1928. Now, in this passage, Jesus reassures Louisa of the primacy of God becoming the temple of the soul. So let us read it. It's a dialogue between Jesus and Louisa to get its full flavor. Jesus tells Louisa, asks Louisa, which one do you think is a greater prodigy, a greater miracle? That the sun enclosed a tiny light within itself or that the tiny light enclosed the sun within itself. And I answered, Louisa speaks, it would certainly be a greater miracle if the tiny light enclosed the sun within itself. But it seems impossible to me that this could happen. And Jesus said, what is impossible for men is possible for God. The tiny light is the soul. And the sun is my will. Now to make this tiny light enclose the circumference of the sun of my will, my will must impart to it so much power and grace so as to form its circumference. And since the nature of light is to spread its rays everywhere while remaining triumphant within the circumference, It spreads its divine rays to impart the life of my will to everyone. 
This is the miracle of miracles, which all of heaven longs for. And this is also found in volume 19 on May 23rd, 1926. So that concludes our treatise on the difference between the gift of living in the divine will and spiritual marriage. Both are gifts from above. Both make us perfect, but according to two different applications of the one grace of God. The one application of grace that establishes within the soul spiritual marriage is predicated upon the perfection of the Christian virtues. And it takes years to acquire. The application of grace that establishes in the soul the life of the divine will is predicated upon God's gifts, which are greater than the virtues. Even Thomas Aquinas acknowledges this. Remember, it's called the gift, not the virtue, the gift of living in the divine will. Why? Because it doesn't depend upon human effort, human achievement. God is doing it in us. We are simply consenting to this new outpouring, this new application of grace that God is performing within us. Certainly, we have to exercise and perfect the virtues like the saints of the past did, but it's not limited to the perfection of the virtues. You see the difference? Spiritual marriage is limited to the virtues. Their perfection. <clears throat> and once the virtues are perfected and the soul arrives at the state of material impeccability, I'm sorry, formal impeccability, and then it, it achieves the heights of perfection. But now that God has outpoured this greater gift of living in the divine will that transcends eternally the state of spiritual marriage inasmuch as God is eternally operating in the soul who lives in his will which he is not doing in the soul who lives in spiritual marriage then the gifts add unto the virtues they help in the perfection of the virtues and I'm not just talking about the gifts that we receive at confirmation or the charismatic gifts. I'm talking about the mystical gifts. These extraordinary gifts that God is now making ordinary. That is the gift of living in his will. And in, with this one gift of living in his will, I have enumerated 33 new graces that come along with it. Or I should say 33 new application of the one grace of God, which are enumerated in my doctoral dissertation. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, let us aspire, as St. Paul says, to the greater gifts, to love and God's will. These are the two lungs, so to speak, in our bodies that will propel us into the abode of the Most Holy Trinity, whereby God makes himself our temple and we, by welcoming the humanity of Christ and all of our acts, become other Christs, other humanities of Jesus, disposing all souls in the world to the knowledge of this gift and hastening the coming and realization of this gift on earth as it is in heaven, so that his kingdom may come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. May God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.